Uh, my paper today deals with major trends uh, in Poland studies in independent Ukraine. And I focus mostly on the historical branch of Poland studies and concentrate on the newest historiographical schools and international cooperation. I also deal, as well as Sandra Sikan, with some obvious lacuna in Ukrainian border studies, uh, many of which, from my understanding, have obviously contributed to the dramatic escalation of recent crisis, at least on its ideological level. And what I'll show today, there are uh, quite a lot of book covers for you. Um, many are mentioned today by Sandra Sikan, also yesterday partly, um, but it's also a selection. It's my selection, and please don't be offended if your book is not <laughs> on the slides. Um, uh, and my idea for this presentation was that uh, the years 2013-14 uh, could be fully regarded as a watershed, marking the beginning of the greatest turmoil in contemporary Ukrainian history. Uh, Euromaidan and the war in Ukraine borders brought also a new agenda for experts in the field of border studies. Because the new crisis tends to be also a conflict around the borders of various countries or international uh, units, borderland studies are in high demand. One speaks also uh, about the times before and after uh, the borderland studies. Accordingly, I decided to divide my presentation into parts. The first one deals with the Woodland studies in the period after UK gained uh, independence until 2013. And the second one is devoted to the very recent developments, such as mostly work in progress also. Since I dwelt uh, uh, upon the pre Euromandan Woodland historical elsewhere, and published on this, it will be um, presented rather briefly. Uh, and most attention will go to the current trends. Um, it had been some time since Mark von Hagen uh, published his well resonated article, Does Ukraine Have a History? His doubts as to the unpoliticized, the scholarly, independent presentation of Ukrainian history met with waves of criticism both in Ukraine and elsewhere. As you know. In the meantime, von Hagen reconsidered his position in relation to the current situation in Ukrainian historical writing and improvingly noted that borderland studies have found a natural home in Ukrainian history. In this sense, Ukraine is conceptualized as a territory whose history has been pulled between two or more empires or states and has been entangled in their geopolitical struggles. In fact, border studies in Ukraine have undergone an obvious renaissance in the past decades. This is reflected not only in numerous publications, but also in a series of conferences, workshops, roundtables. Um, this positive thinking of Ukraine's place in history as a borderland was not only a reply to the critique coming from the other side of the ocean, this is the issue of the diaspora, but also a multifaceted a reaction to the political, economic, and social development in the country since its independence. In pre euromaidan Ukraine, the driving forces in the stream were policy and media makers who urged practicing cross-border cooperation in face of unsettled problems with gas transfer and labor migration, with ethnic minorities and border security. The perceived double nature of, of borderland as territories of attraction and alienation seem to be predominant in re-examining the practices of cross-border and inter-regional cooperation. Another part of the, uh, uh, or another moving force, uh, included intellectuals. The elimination of Ukrainian borders shortly after 1991 was often seen as a pursuit for nationalizing borderlands in the context of a new state building. Cultural pluralism within Ukrainian borders was sometimes conceived as a potential threat, as Alexander Spratt also mentioned, for future development. Such an approach presumed a certain demand for intellectuals to infuse borders with symbolic meaning and to fit them into historical context. Quote one of the uh, most important uh, authorities in modern studies, Klaus Dedder, 
Institutionalized hard borders rely on the symbolic power inherent in soft borders, which include narratives, memories, and the production of meaning. They are the images people have in their world. The tradition of historically instilling Ukrainian borders with symbolic meaning has its own history, stretching back to the end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th century. The question as to whether Ukraine was just a periphery of both Europe and Asia, or a civilization crossroad between East and West, was a subject of reflections for generations of historian, historians, starting from Rodnitsky and Lipinski. Natalia Kovenko, in this context, um, correctly notes that the paradigm of Ukraine between East and West was often perceived as Ukraine turned to the West. The Ukrainian, uh, Western Ukrainian border was often seen as permeable and porous, whereas the Eastern one with Russia was often presented as a stable wall going up to hell. However, the idea of a lineal national border separating two homogeneous entities did not work well for Ukraine, as it does not work well for any other United state. At least before the outbreak of the recent military conflict, one could trace a certain shift in Ukrainian studies from the interest in national borders, particularly in the East, towards the application of more interpretive borderland concept which describes a place of interaction and cultural exchange relevant to the whole country. It is also a remarkable change in the interdisciplinary focus, from my understanding, from the political geographical interpretations of borders as territorial lines of separation and the way these lines were demarcated to the social historical notion of borders as social constructs with attested overlapping identities. This new, or I would better say newly found, way of thinking borders in Ukrainian studies ran parallel to the revival of border studies in other post-Soviet countries. Scholars of Ukraine often place themselves within the local liminology, so border studies basically, which encompasses not only the studies of center peripheral relations, regional history, and border identity discourses, but also the insights into images of the enemy, psychology of the border and conflict resolution tactics. Regarding that, just, I will focus just on this historical dimension. This historical dimension of pre Euromadan Ukrainian border studies uh, is worth outlining a few of the most noticeable directions I just listed. One is the regional history. Ukraine's regional past is shaped by its regional peculiarities, which became a subject of a scholarly discussion, you well know, shortly after the collapse of the Soviet Union. Debates whether we have to deal with two or 22 Ukraines catalyzed further considerations about regional peculiarities in the country. Political impetus in new Ukrainian regional historiography came with the Orange Revolution. Ryabchuk's earlier thesis on Ukrainian forms of colonization was often interpreted within the post-colonial framework as an application of the Orientalism approach. But more importantly, Ukrainian history has been seen within the center periphery dichotomy within the necessary retribution of the backwardness features of the latter. Regional history as part of border studies was a compensatory reaction to these challenges. And I think the uh, book of the Kratchen, which you see here, um, uh, called on Sobranchina, Hakki Kharkov, the capital of the borderland, it's a paradigmatic for such a shift. This book interprets Ukrainian regions as imagined places. Similar mythology has been applied by Larry Wolf, for instance, in his study of Galicia. There is another approach um, to be traced in contemporary Ukrainian regional studies. Some Ukrainian historians transfer the concept of a borderland as a multi-confessional, multilingual, and multi-ethnic space upon large territorial entities. They place Ukraine within the so-called mass borderland regions, or even the borderland type civilizations, like the Black Sea region, the so-called East European borderland, including Belarus and Moldova, or more traditionally, East Central Europe, otherwise defined as New Central. 
one more uh, direction from Tyathesis. Freddie Turner's concept found fertile ground in Ukrainian historical writing. <coughs> Quite naturally, uh, the early modern experts, particularly those dealing with ecotic history, were the first to start to use Turner's concept within their critical analysis. The idea was to provide adequate comparisons with other frontier military units among the U Europe's staff frontier. Even Kritika actually participated in the initiative by publishing Igor Chernobyl's overviews of the frontier concept in historiography. Later publications from Volodymyr Rogunenko, Brian Burke, Sergei Lukyak, which is put their covers here, as well as the earlier course contributions of Yaroslav Dashkevich, proved the success of this application and testified to the ongoing interest in such studies. Uh, it seems that the most flourishing aspect of pre Madan Ukrainian modern studies was the concept of the frontier. This was predominantly due to the traditional interest of Ukrainian editors, historians to the Cossack Spassi game, mentioned by Alexander Sikhan today. However, it was also due to the extensive Russian Soviet scholarship in the field. And I would, for instance, place the book of uh, Hiroaki Kromia on the past history of this, this category. Uh, one more direction, borderland mythology and discourse analysis. This field seems to be also quite on vogue for pre euromedanian Ukrainian borderland studies. Research went mostly in two directions. The study of the Cossack myth uh, in Ukrainian history uh, with, um, uh, with this text, for instance, uh, coming from Yulia uh, Gorda, Jenny Albert, um, and of course, Sergei uh, Polhi on the story of Rusia. Um, and the comparative investigation into the notions of border and borderland in political media and academic debates in Ukraine, Russia, and Poland. Uh, besides uh, Polhi's uh, Cossack myth, uh, I would also mention here uh, Stephen Zigan's monograph and catalog on cartographic imaginary. The analysis of post imperial discourse in terms of borders and contact zones was a fruitful field which attracted scholars of literature, experts on regional studies, and cross-border cooperation, and put the Tiana Zhurzhenko borderlands into borderlands also in this category. Okay. But I think it's, it fits well. Um, also mentioned today, borderlands <laughs> as communication regions. Um, the interactional aspect of the borderland life is a favorite child of many East European historians, sociologists, ethnographers, anthropologists, and religious scientists. The, questions, the question put forward by the Polish sociologist Tomasz Zaretsky, Czewartowicz Pogranicza, would be positively answered by most of these scholars. A certain borderland phenomenon described as a cultural hybridity or secretism or synthesis or bricolage, pluralism or polyphony or osmosis is often praised in these studies. The difference in definitions is rather unclear. The general meaning could be summarized as a situation of belonging to multiple cultures in the so-called cultural zones. Such territories, otherwise called communication regions, are characterized by dense inner interaction <coughs> multiple cultural practices and experiences. Particularly early modern historians of Ukraine tended to trace commonalities across state borders and church jurisdictions. This, this is the volume of Stefan Bodewald, um, uh, David Frick, and uh, Stefan, uh, uh, I, I forgot it's just the third name, um, uh, on Lithuania and Ruthenia as communicative regions, but also some other titles on Slobozhanshina are fitting in this category as, uh, as well uh, as uh, studies of the multicultural cities of the region, Lithuania and Odessa. The idea of cultural interaction in border zones seems to be also appealing for anthropologists dealing with the religious situation in modern Ukraine in a historical perspective. Catherine Warner and Vladimir Mesko focused on the mutual influences in the history of churches in between, the Greek Catholics and Pentecostals. The tradition of a peaceful coexistence, Ukrainian denominationalism, was often interpreted as a precondition for the recent religious revival of the country. 
a remarkable event, and here I also confirm the conclusions of Alexander Osikan in this um, in this issue is a collective monograph of uh, others who were called uh, Koren and Kuzmani on the Ukrainian cities on both sides of the Russian-Austrian border. This is getrennt und doch verbunden. And the authors, I just wrote uh, a couple of years um, a review on this, and I just really recommend it. The authors provided close analysis of transfer and communication processes between such twin cities. Similar attempts in studying East European borderlands were undertaken also by Tatiana Jozhenko and Kate Brown. An American anthropologist, Carolina Follis, released 2012 a monograph on the cross-border cooperation and labor migration in the post-2004 Polish Ukrainian border. Apparently, the interest to the communicative aspect of Ukrainian border life is had not only uh, was had uh, not only from the local but also from international sources. In sum, for this uh, pre-Euromaidan period, uh, one could observe a radical splash of interest in Ukrainian border studies during the last decades. Already before 2013-14. Original emphasis on Galician border was no, no longer current. New regional studies on southern and eastern borders testified to its diversification and internationalization. However, considerable emphasis on Kazakh history as a typical Ukrainian border phenomenon remained in the foreground, as well as the fear of cultural imperialism from the centers. In this way, Bodman studies continue to be part and parcel of a national scheme of Ukrainian history. Apparently, um, many Ukrainian leaders treated multi-ethnicity and religious plurality as an inherited obstacle, a feature of a backward periphery, hazarding Ukrainian uh, country's future. I shall show you just a prominent quotation from Viktor Yanukovych, Viktor Yanukovych, 2006, um, where he says, I would like to assure you that Europe and America should not look for Ukraine somewhere on the borderland. After the completion of reforms and strengthening of its economy, Ukraine will be placed in the very center of the Euro-Atlantic world. A political fear to be a borderland somewhere in between was caused also by the fact that political and academic discourses do not overlap in modern Ukraine. The politicians did not understand the value of being a borderland, and the intellectuals suffered from the positive resources. As stated by Inga Ivashuv, the editor of the journal Borderland, Stetchin, a borderland which lacks political support turns to be proof. There is also another side in the Ukrainian way of thinking borders before 2013-14. The above-mentioned historiographical tradition of just the position of Ukraine as a country of cultural pluralism to Russia as a closed community led to occasional idealization of the bottom experience. The kind of non-antagonistic relationship a certain safe world declared in several historical writings and gave birth to a somewhat polished image of a woodland man. In the description of the Polish publicist Krzysztof Czerzewski, a man from a borderland is characterized by tolerance, openness to dialogue, ability to rise above divisions, civic and neighborhood patriotism, universalism, freedom and responsibility, self-criticism, openness to the world, and the art of remembrance. You can find analogous um, images in different Ukrainian regional historical studies. But in the shadow of idealization of a borderland experience remain the opposite side of it, the history of violence and separation. Uh, one of uh, my uh, colleagues in the Central European University in Budapest, Professor Alfred Rieber, has once analyzed the biography and political career of Joseph Stalin as a man of borderland. Regarding the transformation of Stalin's identities within the context of a so-called frame analysis, Rieber noticed that in the borderland Georgian, Georgian warrior country, emblematic was a code of courage, loyalty, and patriotism favored by Stalin, but also the dichotomies of friends and enemies, trust and disloyalty, which can be interpreted in two ways, as proofs applied to one's own conduct 
onto that of the others. I think a comparative path in Ukrainian borderland studies could probably help to avoid precautions and ideological pitfalls. Now I'm moving to very recent development and just later waiting for your comments. The latest events in Ukraine have sparked a reassessment of the country's place in history of modern nations, nationalism, geopolitics, memory, and religious institutions. Moreover, borderland studies gave a second wind uh, that stimulated fresh intellectual input into all the above mentioned research directions. <coughs> First of all, the geopolitical aspect of the Ukrainian crisis influenced the recent conceptualization of the notion of borderland in relation to Ukraine's role in world politics and historical studies. It is precisely the borderland position of the Ukrainian lands that makes it interesting to many experts. However, some of them see the typical weakness of in-between or squeeze countries, to quote a Canadian politologist Mikhail Milchan. This is the classical view of borderland as a periphery describing various disadvantages of living in the buffer zone. The Euromaidan events and the frozen conflict in the Donbass region revived the old thesis about two Ukrainians in the popular discourse. Politicians and the mass media legitimized their strategies by presenting discrepancies and conflicting memories in different parts of Ukraine. This, in turn, led Mikhail to reformulate his thesis. In the light of the critical situation of the country's borders, Rebchuk shifted the accent from the different identities characterizing Ukrainian regions to the rise of civic nationalism in all parts of the country. And here is a quotation from 2015. The majority of Russian-speaking Ukrainians and the relative majority of ethnic Russians who were previously ambivalent in their loyalties to Moscow and Kiev made their choice under the war conditions in favor of Ukraine, placing civic, not ethnic, or linguistic and cultural priorities in the foreground. But last year, and this is the cover of this book, Rebchuk released a monograph, Overcoming Ambiguity, the Dichotomy of Ukrainian National Identity, in which he has somewhat reformulated his argument. Ukraine belongs to the geopolitically amorphous zone, and this year, pardon, Ukraine belongs to the geopolitical morphous zone in between and demonstrates fully fledged borderland features. This situation in between will continue to exist unless Ukraine makes its last civilizational choice and institutionalizes it by the NATO and the European Union membership. Other scholars interpret Ukraine's borderland position from a bright perspective. Presented borderland Ukraine in the foreground of the European and world struggle for freedom and democratic values. Pragmatic in this sense is the monograph of Sergei Plahi, the Kings of Europe, in which Ukraine is presented as a gateway to Europe for many centuries. I shall save some time and you can read one quotation and another one about uh, two moving frontiers uh, that determined. Uh, for centuries, a unique set of cultural features that form the foundation of present-day Ukrainian identity. This idea found support in recent publications of other movement experts. It's worth not noting that all of them affirmed the effect that the crisis had had on the perception of the regions in Ukrainian public opinion, and I quote Tatyana Zhuzhenko, the local political and intellectual elites in eastern Ukraine, above all in Kharkiv, the Donetsk and Luhansk, reinvented their regions as borderlands, first of all, in order to justify the close cultural ties and economic cross border cooperation with Russia. In addition, Ukrainian regional history has produced new interpretations and studies legitimizing shifts of state borders. Regional studies witnessed an obvious revival in recent borderland studies. It's enough to mention two most recent books, 2015 and 18, of Yaroslav Vermenich, both devoted to the southern and eastern borders of Ukraine. In your Donbass, monograph and Manich argues for the reconceptualization of the region's place in Ukrainian borderland studies. For her, the reference to the, in reference to the famous Wallerstein's concept, Donbass belongs to the so-called semi-periphery, 
particular. But I manage to affirm that the development of Donbass border region in the last decades followed the frontier logic. It was a space of constantly transforming contents with a permanent iceberg of Russian mentality and culture. She also opts for more attention to such communication regions in contemporary Ukraine away from traditional set of periphery paradigm. Again, uh, Frontier Swiss found new life in recent years. The, um, it almost, the crisis in Ukraine almost naturally revived the idea of uh, wild fields where people are fighting for their freedom. The Euromedan protests are presented by some uh, as the direct heirs of the Zaporozhian siege, where other scholars see the roots of the conflict in the Donbass and the freedom like tradition of Ukrainian southern regions. Besides, the manage uh, Kuromiya pays attention to the tradition of a border phenomena in Donbass as anti-metropolism. Other scholars like Igor Chernobyl, and here is his uh, monograph, 2015, accentuate the necessity of comparative studies of frontiers. More uh, testimonies uh, for the popularity of uh, frontier thesis include, uh, among others, Ostap Kushnir's last year monograph, Ukraine and Russian Neo Imperialism. Kushnir argues that the legacy of the Great Border, the Black Sea Step in contemporary Ukrainian political culture, envisages purposeful engagement of the socially active minority into the policy making, as well as understanding that the Ukrainian nation building was always stochastic, decentralized, and to some extent irrational. None less flourishing nowadays are the studies of border mythology and discourse analysis. Again, Steven Ziegler, with his new release monograph, Mad Men, on lives and political activities of uh, early 20th century cartographers, uh, and mostly dealing with the imagining of Ukrainian national space. Uh, similar problems, I didn't put his uh, title here, are uh, tackled by Sergei Belenki, uh, Volume Romantic Nationalism in Eastern Europe. Um, another valuable contribution uh, into political and cultural imagination of Ukraine's historical borders is uh, the monograph of Tomasz Zaritsky, Ideologies of Isthmus in Eastern Central Europe. And uh, if I may, I show you. Um, my own uh, recent book, uh, released this year in the Europe, Round of Nations, which also could be placed in this category. Uh, our book, which we released together with Heidi van Kirche from Henry Institute here in Germany, deals with bulwark or anti moralis that has been a persistent strand in the development of East European nationalism. And Ukrainian lands are in core of our study with several contributions on different aspects of its anti moralis mythology. Uh, Ukrainian borderland capitals, the history of Ukrainian cities as places of interconfessional, multi ethnic, and multicultural exchange on borderland, drew much attention of, scholar, of scholars after the outbreak of Euromandan and war in the eastern uh, Ukrainian borders. Chernivtsi, Kharkiv, Lviv, but also Odessa, Zaporizhia, and Dnipro are a focus of the studies dealing with urban spaces that turned to be sites of politicized placemaking and conflicting memories in search for new identities. <coughs> Last year, uh, Sergei Belenki uh, has released a new monograph on the history of Kyiv as an imperial and multi-ethnic city under the umbrella of Russian modernity. In the reference to the Ilya Feithili's book, Belenki regards the history of the 19th century Kyiv precisely from a borderland perspective tracing the ways how various agents produced the city space and turned a frontier town into metropolis. Last but not least, many anthropologists, church historians, and border practitioners continued to conduct research into the ways of cross-border cooperation and interconfessional contexts in post maidan Ukraine. Two collections of articles of their latter aspect should be mentioned here. One is the volume uh, edited by uh, Catherine Warner, 2015, and another by Thomas Bremer and Andriy Kravchuk, Churches in the Ukrainian Crisis. Particularly the Ukrainian group Catholic 
church to systematize an institution searching for cross-border interconfessional exchange. One of the contributors, uh, Avakumov, from, from previously, um, uh, in, the, in the latter volume, in Thomas Bremer and uh, Andrei Kravchuk's volume, puts this as following. The Greek Catholic criminality has much in common with the intellectual and spiritual atmosphere of postmodernity that Empress essentialism blurs dividing lines, delves uh, into borderline zones, and focuses on marginalized existence. Also, I would mention in this context the Berlin based project Phantom Grenzen. Phantom Borders in the Central Europe, you, many of you know this project, which has, among others, the project on Ukraine, focusing on the symbols and monuments in two villages on opposite sides of the historical border in Western Ukraine. Very much in spirit of the above mentioned book on Twin Cities, uh, von Lewis, Sabina von Lewis, who runs this project, sheds light on the ambivalent identities on the both sides of this Bush River. One of the fathers of the Phantom Borders concept, a, a cooperative partner of Rovis project, uh, is a Moscow-based geographer, Vladimir Kolosov, who has last year released a collective monograph, Rosyska Pogranichi of Vizovisasyevstvo, a Russian borderland's challenges of neighborhood. Part of the volume is devoted to the contemporary Russian-Ukrainian border. The author argued uh, that despite the expected total economic downfall, several minor forms of cross-border cooperation still exist. Such exchanges testify for the unique ability of the local border population to adapt to radical changes in the everyday life and activities. And now is my conclusion. I just need one minute. Um, new border studies of Ukraine testify to its diversification and internationalization. To my knowledge, however, this did not result till now in any close comparative analysis of Ukrainian borders similar to that undertaken by Vladimir Kolosov and Russian materials, nor to the inadequate typology of borders in the historical perspective. And I have also some suggestions. There are several ways in which borderland studies in Ukraine can evolve. One is offered by the theory of cultural ambiguity. The characteristic feature of all contact zones, its cultural plurality, <coughs> has long become a research subject for medievalists, <coughs> early modern historians, scholars of Islam, as well as anthropologists of borderlands. Many of the scholars underline the higher level of ambiguity in relation to powers and institutions in borderlands in comparison to the central regions. One of my colleagues in Munster, Thomas Bauer, he's an expert in uh, actually medieval Islamic cultures, but also generally uh, Islam, mentions the different phases of ambiguity tolerance, which assumes unclearness and pluralism. Thomas Bauer uses the term ambiguity training in this context. He also defines periods of attempts to accommodate on the political level uh, ambiguous relationship in history. Recently, also Philip Thier used the example of Upper Silesia to define different strategies that borderland population have demonstration, demonstrated to cope with so-called compulsory ambiguity, Zwang zu Eindeutigkeit in the age of nationalism. These are, uh, sorry, to join uh, one of the competing movements, to resist and establish regional movements, and to tr retreat into the private sphere and maintain distance from political activities in general, including the competing nationalism. Besides, of course, Islamic cultures and Upper Silesia, a prominent example for border ambiguity is the Balkans. And in connection uh, to the Balkan studies, there are several anthropologists who speak about ambiguous marginality. And I put here a very short a quotation of one of the um, anthropologists, Sarah uh, Green, who uh, writes about uh, fractality, so the so fundamental interrelationality uh, in Balkans um, that renders something fractal. Ukraine is not 
opus. Uh, but adequate comparisons are often appealing, at least and this seemed to be the case before the outbreak of the recent Ukrainian crisis. Afterwards, many scholars noticed that the transformation of the eastern border, the front line, means the end of ambiguity. Borderlands have indeed turned into bloodlands. Still, uh, I think it's worth paying attention to the persistence and fluctuations in this aspect. Another um, promising field, and we are here in the, um, due to the chair of Tangle history, um, uh, in, in the context of European borders is the method of transnational entangled history. The collection of articles edited by the Ritiar Kassiano identified a way that can also be used by historians dealing with Ukrainian borders and contact zones. More importantly, such an approach allows placing Ukrainian history within the general European context. Entangled history, as you know, goes further than comparative history as it suggests tracing interaction and transfer not only between immediate neighbors but also between the entities and institutions far away from the borderline. Particular fruitful for these purposes are urban, religious, and myth-making history. Perhaps it's time to readdress the theoretical typologies of borderlands, contact zones, and cultural ambiguities in Ukrainian history in order to prevent the further escalation of the conflict. Thank you very much for your attention.